Hi friends, New Life Mumbai. It's so good to be with you all. Uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Shannon, Pastor Samir and the leadership for the opportunity for me to be able to share with you from God's word. Uh, hope you're all, all doing well. The world is going through one of the most stressful periods in modern times, isn't it? Economic, political, mental and emotional stress and uncertainty about the future and uh, it's put a lot of pressure on life as we know it. And if we are honest, the times which we are going through have confronted people of faith with certain hard questions, such as, is the world really under the control of a loving, almighty creator God? If so, why do things seem so out of control? Why is there so much chaos and uncertainty in our world? Where is God in the midst of all this? And so, fear and anxiety have gripped not only people out there, but if we're honest, even among some believers. Believers are experiencing faith under fire, stress. The big question, why? Why do things such as this Corona-19 pandemic happen? All of you are waiting for the answer. Hope you're not disappointed. My short answer is, don't know. Yes, friends, we don't know. All I can share with you from God's word is what we do know. We do know, and the Bible teaches, that we live in a broken world. Bible teaches that the fall of man has affected the state of the earth, and all creation is under the curse and is growing due to death and decay. You find that in Romans chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. So the world is not how it should be. And in a broken world, pain, grief, disease, and death are part of the normal human experience. A second thing we may observe is that global disasters, such as the present pandemic, are painful reminders that there are limits to human power. That despite all the achievements of human progress, human beings is, are helpless before the forces of nature. Yes. Humanity is still not in control of our world. And you know what that does? It humbles human pride, modern human pride. It forces us to recognize our dependence on the Lord of the universe. So people who have never prayed in their lives before, I'm told, in these last few months, have started praying. But then, coming to the more pertinent question, how does faith in God endure the kind of human tragedy that we see all around us today? I believe the faith of true believers should not only survive, it should thrive and grow stronger in times such as these because of one important truth, one word. That's a familiar word and I want to say it out loud, the word hope, hope. What is hope? Hope is what enables us to look to the future believing that things will be better than they are now. Human beings need many things to live, don't we? We need air, we need food, we need water, we need companionship and so on. But I suggest to you today that nothing is more important to life than hope. Someone has said, hope is to life what oxygen is to the lungs. We need it to survive. Now having said that, when you hear the word hope, I don't know what images come to your mind. In today's world, hope means 
something that may or may not happen. It's a possibility with a question mark at the end of it. So we say things like, you know, we look out of the window, I hope it doesn't rain today. Or I hope I get this job. I hope I get this promotion or a raise in my salary. Young person walking towards the, the examination hall is praying, Lord, I hope I pass this exam. Well, the word hope as used in the Bible, elpis, means something totally different, friends. Let me try and define it for you. Hope, the word elpis means, and I'm summarizing uh, what you will find in as you look at the word hope in different contexts, but I'm summarizing it in this one phrase. Hope is the expectation or anticipation of what is sure. Something that is certain. That is biblical hope. Now, if that is what the Bible teaches about hope, an expectation or anticipation of something that we are sure is going to happen. What is the basis of our hope? Let me turn to a few passages, a few verses of scripture in Titus chapter 2, reading from verses 11 to 13, where Paul writing to Titus says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all peoples. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to suggest to you this morning in this brief message that our hope as Christ followers rests on four pillars, four things that the Bible says are going to happen at some point of time in the future. The first is the hope of Christ's return. The blessed hope of the return of our Lord Jesus. And this is captured in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading verses 16 and 17, where Paul writes, For the Lord himself will come down from, from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. His coming is certain, beloved. Jesus promised to return. He himself promised to return. But at his ascension in Acts chapter 1, the angels who appeared, promised he would return just as he had gone to heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4 passage gives us a little more detail. It says, first, we hear the trumpet, then the shout of the archangel, and then the believers who are, have died in Christ will be raised to life, and then those believers who are alive, who knows when... While we are alive, this may happen. Believers who are alive will join them and meet the Lord. Now, when will this happen? The Bible says it will be sudden and it will be unexpected. Now, there are some people who like to project a possible date or sequence of events. Now, if that were possible, the Bible wouldn't suggest that this will come unexpectedly as a thief in the night. Let me remind you what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36 and then 42. He said, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then the word of caution. Keep watch, therefore, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Here's the truth, friends. Yes, Jesus is coming back. God does not want us to get too comfortable down here. And although there are different views regarding the timing of Jesus' return, one thing is for sure. We know for sure 
He's coming back. Amen? That's the first basis of our hope. But then secondly, the Bible speaks of the hope of the resurrection. 3,000 years ago, the prophet Job posed this question. In chapter 14, verse 14. If a man dies, will he live again? This is a question that has plagued human beings since time memorial. Is death the end or is there something more? Now, the fact of the matter is, in today's world, some people try to avoid the question. They say, well, you know, why think about it? They consider this morbid talk. But the COVID pandemic has brought this question to us face to face each day. It has compelled us to face this question every day. And why is this question so important? I suggest to you, common sense requires us to consider this question. Even before the COVID pandemic, approximately 200,000 people die every day on the planet, friends. Yes, I know that's a shocking number, but that's true. And guess what? One of these days, you and I will be in that 200,000 statistic. It's common sense. When we are sure we are going to die, see, why not ask the question, what happens to us after death? We should be asking that question. Where do we go when we die? Now, for those who are in Christ, the Bible promises it clearly, unmistakably. And we've read that verse in 1 Thessalonians 4. When the trumpet sounds, the dead will rise. So death is not the end of the road. It's only a bend in the road. Paul tells us elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 to 55, he gives us a glimpse what actually happens. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. When the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. All of that we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. But here he goes on to say, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory, O oh, death. Where is your victory, O oh, death? Where is your sting? I love that phrase. Death is swallowed up in victory. So what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 is that when the trumpet sounds, not only will the dead rise, they will not just come back to life, but an amazing, miraculous transformation will happen. He describes it in these words. Mortal will become immortal. Our dying bodies will be transformed into bodies that will never die. So let's sing that song, shall we? Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That must be the song that undergirds our lives, friends. Even as we go through a COVID pandemic or whatever uh, uh, uncertainties lie ahead, the last chapter in life for every believer it's not the funeral, the casket, or the grave. It's the sure and blessed hope of the resurrection. Amen. So the hope of Christ's return, the hope of the resurrection, and thirdly, the hope of the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says it, succinctly and bluntly, just as it is appointed for man to die once. And after that comes judgment. Yes, beloved, I know that's not a nice word. We don't like to hear it at least. The Bible teaches that the first coming of Jesus was in humility to save, but his second coming will be in power 
to judge. Yes. But let me describe this judgment to you. Nothing in all the universe is hidden from the judge of all the earth who will preside on that last day judgment. This judge knows not only our words and actions, he also sees the deepest recesses of every person's heart. He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives. You cannot deceive or bribe that judge. You can't bring false witnesses to try and confuse this judge. He knows every detail of within every human heart. Please note this, friends. His judgment is final. There is no higher court. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, this is judgment. How are you calling this part of our blessed hope? Hold on for a moment. Hmm? Think back to the time when something happened and you said, oh, life seems so unfair. Hmm? Have you ever felt that way? There's so much injustice in the world. The widow who's robbed of her rights by unscrupulous land sharks. Or the girl who has been deceived, sexually exploited, and then tossed aside as a used rag. Many, many, many such instances of injustice on our planet. The corrupt seem to get away scot-free, while honest people seem to lose. Have you thought about it? I have. Will these innocent victims ever get justice? Well, let me remind you of Jesus' words, Luke chapter 18, verse 7. We, it's connected, yes, to the theme of prayer. But please notice his words. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Yes, yeah, silent cries which seemingly go unheard. God hears. And the promise is, will he keep putting them off? A rhetoric question. The answer is obvious, no. No. The victims of cold-blooded rapists and murderers who have never been brought to justice, the millions of martyrs who was burnt at the stake, thrown to the lions, brothers and sisters, tortured for their faith, who spent lifetime in prison. Don't they need justice? Answer that resonates back from beyond friends. The judge of the earth says yes, a resounding yes. And Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 onwards, how this will happen. He says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Will God really judge evildoers and the godless so severely? Well, if you have any doubt, I want you to turn your face towards this judge. The loving God Yes, this judge of all the earth is a loving father. And as you look at his face, I believe you will see his finger pointing towards the cross. And the figure who gave his life on the cross. And he doesn't need to say a word, friends, because that finger says it all. That's my son. My only son whom I punished with a punishment so deep, so painful, no human being will ever understand it. But he took that punishment for one reason, one reason alone, your sin and my sin. The cross says it all, friends. That's how seriously God takes sin. He will judge sin. Whenever he finds it, 
even if it breaks his heart. I know the hope of judgment is bad news for the evil person, friends. But for the victims of injustice, it spells hope. But I must move on to the final, fourth and final basis of our hope. The hope of the new heavens and the new earth. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. I love how the message version puts it. Daily expect the day of God. Eager for its arrival. The galaxies will burn up and the elements will melt down that day, but we'll hardly notice. For we'll be looking the other way, ready for the promised new heavens and the promised new earth, all landscaped with righteousness. Why do we believe in heaven? Yes, because the Bible says so, but I believe there's another reason as well, friends. I believe in heaven because the soul has always felt and longed for such a place. Ask your unbelieving neighbor. The person who is not yet a person of faith, they believe in heaven, I guarantee you, nine out of 10 of them will say yes. And I love how this illustration makes it come alive. A little boy was flying a kite and the kite was so far out, it was out of sight. And someone who looked at the sky, who couldn't see it, turned to the little boy and said, how do you know your kite is out there? Can you see it? <clears throat> I love the little boy's answer. <clears throat> he said, without taking his eyes away from the sky, he said, yes, I know it is there because I can feel it tug. That's your answer, friends. We know there is a heaven because we can feel the tug of it in our souls, can't we? But then I believe in heaven, especially because God says there's a heaven. He speaks of the, the Bible speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. A day not so uh, long in the future when heaven and earth will be married no longer separation between God's dwelling place and ours. Yes, beloved, I believe in heaven. By the way, the new heavens and the new earth won't be a place where spirits float around like ghosts. But we will experience real life with resurrected bodies in that place of incredible beauty and perfection of unending wonder and delight. And whatever else we don't know about it, this is what we know. It'll be a place of awesome no mores or never agains. A glimpse from the book of Revelation. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never again be scorched by the heat of the sun. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, never again tears. And there will be never again, no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. For heaven is where God is, beloved. Yes. From the trauma of childbirth to the pain of bereavement, life is full of pain. As human beings, we do our best to cope with or try and run away. But pain and tragedy have a way of bringing us to the place where we have nowhere to look but upward, right? Upward. For God is our only hope in times like this, dear friends. As I conclude, I want to remind you of a passage in the Old Testament penned by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah has just witnessed a massive catastrophe, the fall of Jerusalem. And in the dark days that followed this catastrophe, he writes the book of Lamentations. And I'm going to close reading a few verses which I'm sure are familiar to many of us. Verse 18, I'm reading from the NLT version. Jeremiah says, so I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. 
I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Perhaps this describes the feeling of many people through this pandemic and perhaps some of us still occasionally slip back into those moments. But I want you to know this verse 21 onwards. Jeremiah, in the midst of the ashes of Jerusalem, he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, and I pray you say it with me to yourselves, beloved, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. For the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one or the ones who seek him. Yes, beloved. Hope is confidence. Confidence that some things will come to pass because God has promised that they will come to pass. And that sure hope is what keeps us joyful, joyfully expectant, even under the most adverse circumstances. For God has given us at least these four pillars of hope, the promise of his return, the certainty of the resurrection, the fact of the coming judgment, and above all, the awesome promise of the new heavens and the new earth. I pray as we reflect on these truths, God will inject in our hearts real faith, confidence about a secure future. It's real, friends, as real, more real than the chair or the sofa you're sitting on right now. Our Father, yes, Lord, there are moments of despair, there are moments of discouragement. But in the midst of the discouragement and despair that is often real to, to the experience of our present times, we look to you with hope. We look to you with assurance. We look to you, Lord, with a hope that does not make us ashamed, a hope that is certain you're coming back, Jesus. Hmm. You are coming back. And even though, Lord, our bodies are dying daily, we look forward, Lord, to the moment when as the trumpet sounds, or if we are alive and remain, we are, these mortal bodies will be transformed into bodies that will never die. We anticipate the certainty of judgment. And through the clouds of judgment, we look forward to the certainty of the new heavens and new earth. I pray for everyone, Lord, who has listened to this message, who is under the sound of my voice right now. By your Holy Spirit, you'll inject every one of us with a sure and certain hope. Hope that keeps us joyfully expecting as we face an uncertain future. Pray this in your precious and wonderful name, Lord Jesus. All God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you.